Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. People are probably going to trickle in for a little bit, but uh, we can kick off since we're already recording. And if anybody misses anything, they can see the recording. Um, I'm going to pull up questions here and make sure I'm situated. So there is a Q&A box uh, in Zoom for people who are attending. You are welcome to ask questions in there. I will be watching that as we go. We've got a big, long list of questions that we're going to work through uh, that we drummed up from some people who were asking beforehand, but uh, feel free to ask throughout, and we'll um, try to get to as many of these as we can. So to get started, um, first of all, I'm Kendall from Fairwinds. We're a remote company. Uh, I've been working remote for five years. Uh, I live in Colorado where it's dumping snow right now, and I have four kids in the other room uh, working on school. Actually, I think they wrapped up school a few minutes ago. But um, I've been working remote for a long time. I'll be mostly asking questions, but also chiming in with a few things here or there uh, throughout. To get started, I'm going to have folks tell us who you are, where you work, what your experience is working remote, uh, and then how you're doing right now. Because um, I've been doing this a long time, and I'm having a hard time. This is different. So uh, to get started, let's, let's start with Sarah and introduce yourself. Sure. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sarah Zella Husky. I also work at Fairwinds. I'm a VP of engineering here. I've been remote going on seven years now um, in multiple jobs and I live on a farm in Western Massachusetts. So a little bit out in the middle of nowhere. And my wife is a writer, she works from home as well. And we have a 15 month old who's usually here too. So we have experience kind of doing that juggle. Um, but yeah, how am I doing? Um, it's tough right now. And I will say, trying to keep a team engaged and motivated and feeling healthy is a challenge right now, regardless of whether or not they have experience being fully remote. So it's a lot of spending time with folks and talking them through how they're feeling for me and, uh, you know, just being human, but it's, it's hard. Swarna, you want to go next? Sure. Um, I'm Swarna Padilla. I work as a community manager for, at the Cloud Foundry Foundation. I've been working remote for almost two and a half years now. It's definitely uh, significantly different from working in the office and I'm still struggling now because I have all these new co-workers in my office space right now who have absolutely no sense of boundaries or guidelines. So establishing the ground rules and to Sarah's point, um, also checking in, taking that extra time to check in with teammates to make sure that they all are doing okay because some have older parents, some have really young kids and some have uh, spouses or partners who do not have the flexibility to work from home. So how are they dealing with it? It's, these are truly unprecedented times and we are taking all that kind of extra effort mentally and physically to stay sane. Thanks. Brandon? Sure. Uh, Brandon Young. Uh, I lead up alliances, partnerships, kind of uh, a whole bunch of random stuff for GitLab. Um, and uh, GitLab is a, an all remote company and we're about 1200 now in 64 countries. Um, I think th just echoing on the personal level, uh, I have three of my little munchkins outside the door as well. Uh, so I think there's a change there, um, realizing how different this affects everyone. And again, some of, for some people, it's not a huge change for most of us. It's a big change. And so I think the, the emotional piece to the, where we're going through is definitely the bigger one. Um, it hasn't been as big a adjustment for us as a company. Um, We've been all remote and uh, async for since our founding. So I think some of those processes, I try to be aware that this is a bigger change for most people than it is for the company. And I'm seeing it a lot when we work with others. So uh, we're trying to give tools, processes, um, procedures and stuff for people that are just trying to think, how do you work? How, how do you keep everyone out of your workspace? Like Sparna, like, hey, Yes, we want to communicate. How do we do asynchronous communication? Seems different. So uh, learning a lot and then just um, trying to engage and help where we can. Thanks. And how long have you been at GitLab working remote, Brandon? Oh, I've uh, been working remote at GitLab for about two years. Uh, was remote with Google for a while and IBM, so different remote, uh, but never in a company that's all remote. And that's actually very different. Uh, 
than, uh, than if the company has a, a headquarters. So that's been a big change in the last two years in a good way. And I've enjoyed it a lot. Great. Okay. Hey, yep. I'm Kate Taggart. I'm an engineering manager at Stripe currently, um, which is distributed, but not fully remote. Um, I've been there for about seven, eight months. Uh, my team there is mostly based in San Francisco. We've got one person up in Portland, Oregon, another person who's joining soon from New York. Um, before that, though, I was at HashiCorp for two and a half years, which is like 90% remote. Um, and then prior to that, um, I had managed a couple of like partially co-located, partially remote teams at, at prior jobs too. So um, I've been on the either partially remote or fully remote train for, for a little while now. Oh, and it's, uh, yeah, how I'm, how I'm coping. Well, I made the very silly decision. Well, it was, it was a good decision, but uh, a couple months back, I moved into a new place. Uh, and since I'm working at a, a job that has an office, I put all my work from home, like my desk and monitor and all my good stuff in storage. Uh, Cause I was like, well, I'm not going to need that anymore. Uh, but now I do. So my roommate and I are figuring out how we can both uh, work in this kind of tiny bite. I mean, you know, San Francisco, it's bigger than my old place though. So in terms of being stuck inside in either apartment, I'd rather be in this one because my old place was way too tiny to deal with the shelter in place order without going nuts. But uh, I do miss my desk. So we're, we're figuring that out. Yeah, and part, part of the reason I asked you to be here, Kate, is I know that you have that long background at mostly remote companies before, and now you're at Stripe, where I'm assuming you've been in the office, and now you're suddenly remote again, and so you're going through some of this change, you know, as it's happening with some of that other experience as well. Um, and then, Christina? Hey, I'm Christina. I'm an engineering director at Zapier. Um, I've been there for almost a year now. They're completely remote, have been from the start. And then prior to that, I was at Envision, so uh, remote there for two years. They're also completely remote. Um, and I work with the team, engineering teams, mostly product engineering teams. So I've got about six teams in my org and um, all the way from New Zealand to the UK and everywhere in between. So my managers are kind of everywhere and the folks that they have are everywhere. So that's been an interesting uh, time zones are always interesting um, <laughs> to, for lack of a better word of, of it. But um, how I'm doing, I've got three young kids. Uh, I am so lucky my wife is able to stay home with them. So they're like preschool age and uh, she is going a little bit crazy with them not going to preschool and having therapy and their activities and things like that. And so that's been an adjustment for us around day three and we have cabin fever. So trying to get outside as much as we can, though it's snowing now just outside of Denver. So it's great but um but yeah with teams trying to trying to just slow down and trying to give people space um to freak out a little bit if they need to um to take time if they need to a lot of people are trying to figure out you know they all work remotely they're used to it but then suddenly their partners are in their space or their kids are in their space and they're having to shift their time to figure out okay i'm going to work at these hours, you're gonna work at these hours just to have coverage and just trying to give a lot of space and support to people that are working through that because on top of all of this, like that is an extra amount of stress and just recognizing that is super important, so. Yeah, on the, on the schooling side for us, it's, um, you know, homeschooling would be easier. We'd have one person's expectations that we could uh, apply across our four kids. Instead, we have four different teachers with varying levels of understanding how to use the internet, uh, applying varying degrees of uh, different expectations. You know, one, one does it really well and three are really bad at it. And uh, it's really difficult trying to manage all the different expectations too. But uh, anyhow, so let's dive into some of the questions. Um, first question I have is you have all worked remotely before. What is different about this situation? And, uh, you know, we've mentioned kids and such, but what else is uh, new or different about this and how are you adjusting to it? Don't everyone speak all at once. Go ahead, Kate. Um, I would say like one, one thing that's, that's different for me is, um, so I have some underlying health issues that mean that I should probably observe the, the stricter form of self isolation isolation and really like not go outside at all until the shelter in place order in SF is lifted. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I always in, like, uh, one of the things that I think is really important when you're working from home is making sure that you're still getting outside a lot. Otherwise you're just inside your house all day. Um, but like 
that's one thing that's really different for me right now is I can't do that. Like I can't just go outside for walks in, in between meetings. Um, so that's like, that's, that's a really big difference. Are you exercising at home? Are you doing something to try to maintain some physical activity? Yeah, I uh, like like I said, like I just got back from Tahoe a couple of, of days ago, so I'm like reestablishing my my home routines. But I do have a few things, like I've got like a back roller and a yoga ball and some like resistance straps and stuff. So um, I'll be able to figure out some kind of like a, in in my room like uh, routine. Um, I can jump in that that I think you know going back to what's different about this is. Um, you know, the sort of restrictions, the added stress around like um, media, everything you hear, like we're a very connected society. Sometimes that's a very bad thing <laughs> in, in times of like over, like people just being overwhelmed. So um, I think, you know, the, it, it's been interesting trying to help people through what their schedule is going to be and trying to plan out like, okay, we're just going to be 50% less productive, you know, let's just call a spade a spade and let's plan for that, you know, and, and if we have more than that, then that's great. But if we don't, that's okay. We're just going to expect that and, and try to keep the humanness in it and, and also plan from a business and team perspective. What does that mean? You know, and, and be realistic. So I think that's kind of what we're coming to terms with that, like, this is not normal, right? And even if you're remote, it's not normal. There's big changes that people are going through and, and I don't know, stepping back and saying, that's okay, so. Yeah, even recognizing as a fully remote company that's used to this, that there is an emotional toll where things are changing and uh, it's affecting people who, who may even have the systems in place to already be productive working with them. Yeah, and I think, um understanding that or recognizing that these are different situations that we are in is extremely important and um, I'm also looking at one of the questions that came in um, I cannot even imagine how single parents or solo parents um, have to manage this whole thing with um, I think for me the first thing that I learned when I was work when I started working from home for the first time in my life two and a half years ago was to identify the routine that works for me and um, setting a routine that I'm gonna wake up at this time finish cooking all these kind of chores that I have to do anyway during this time so that they don't get in my way during the rest of the day that helped a lot because there there were some things that I could move out of my the rest of the day schedule so that I could focus on juggling the rest of the things. And I think now um, for the past few days, that whole thing got kicked out of the back as well because now I'm into this whole new schedule or routine where I have all these new coworkers in my space that I have to manage or I have to cater to their attention. And online learning or distance learning for our school district will start um, next week. So we still have to entertain the kids. So kind of figuring out all of those things while we uh, have to always, again, go back to work and focus on our deadlines as well has been challenging. So um, first of all, kudos to all those single parents or single caretakers that have to deal with all of those things. But I think it's okay to remind ourselves, um, especially now of all the times that it's okay if our house is not stick and span or if um, sometimes we just have cereals as dinner it's perfectly okay um it's about living in i mean still not killing each other i guess and uh making sure that we stay sane about all of it and just stay healthy and it's okay to give ourselves that kind of additional room in our heads that we are not going to be the same as we were a couple of weeks ago like our house is not going to look the same it's perfectly okay and uh one thing that also has helped at least with uh us in the sense that even though again we are also a remote company the entire linux foundation is pretty distributed and, and most of us work remotely as well but we still had to take that additional time to remind ourselves that we are not going to be 100 percent productive we're not even going to be close to 100 percent productive this time and it's okay um, it's okay for us to spend half the day focusing on the things that matter like taking care of the folks that depend on us or just entertaining them or sometimes taking care of ourselves just shutting everything down and paying attention to what our body and mind are telling us i think that has worked a bit i still can't say that has worked because sometimes there are some moments where it doesn't work um 
and just reminding that it's okay. Yeah, the, um, I mean, I'm noticing, like, I'm sitting here touching my face the entire time, too. Like, there's all this, uh, you know, just, and uh, it's it's really interesting, you know, Swarna, you mentioned the patterns you've had to get into in order to survive working remotely long term, and, uh, you know, definitely, like, I think the first two years I did it, it was just easy. I was productive, and it was fine. And about two years in, I started to go really stir crazy and I started to get out of the house almost every day for lunch. And I ride my bike somewhere and I have lunch with someone so that I get exercise and people time and I come home refreshed. And now I'm like <laughs> dying. Uh, you know, I'm trying to go for exercise in the middle of the day, but it's, it's, it's hard to get in. So um, one of the questions that came in, you know, this is, this is relevant to folks that have been leading teams in particular uh, remotely for a long time. What are the kinds of things that you do to, what do you implement with remote employees to maintain culture and a sense of connectedness? And, uh, you know, particularly for people who are just starting this, what, what kinds of things work for your teams? Can I jump in on this one? Because I'm really excited about this. Um, remote culture is really important. And it's one of the things that has been, front of my mind this week because what we're seeing is companies that have um, you know this culture where they've had some remote teams or people for a while and they may have had co-located people and you're now crashing them together uh, in this fully remote workplace and having been in that situation before myself one of the things i find is that remote people who have been doing this for a long time have built up patterns of communication patterns of uh, giving information getting together um, emoji that they that mean things right um, phrases that they use to tell each other what they're doing and when new folks come into that it's really actually challenging because they don't ask, hey, how do we, you know, how do we do our standing meetings in the morning? Or what do I say if I'm in a meeting, but I see your message and I'm gonna answer later? Uh, and so, you know, if the first thing that I would recommend is those co-located folks who are switching to remote. Um, if you do have remote people, ask them how they do it. You know, ask them what the prior art looks like so that you can now be on the same page. If you don't have remote folks and you're all kind of doing this new together, sit down and say, you know, what patterns can we create so that we can all, you know, communicate effectively and know where we are and how we're feeling and how we're doing. Um, just specifically, um, our team has a lot of, and I, I mentioned this in one of the Q&A questions that I just answered, our teams have um, standing Zoom rooms a lot of the time, and you can use it for ad hoc pairing fairly easily by just saying, hey, I'm going to jump in the Zoom room and try to solve this problem if anybody wants to join me. Um, and just being able to do that gives people the option to get together and get on the same page. Um, communication and openness and uh, status has to be completely different. You have to be more transparent. You have to be louder. Otherwise, you will be kind of off in your own corner doing thing and you will feel isolated and people will, you know, not integrate you into the communication path and it gets really hard to feel like a team. And so you have to be louder. You have to talk to each other about the way that you're going to communicate and you have to put patterns out there. Brandon, you had something to say? Yeah, I think um, for us, there, there's a couple things. And um, one, let me give, hold on. Got a link here that might be of help. Um, write everything down. So I think the other part, there's just a process. And this is going to be really hard, I think, if you haven't, if either co-located or you're used to it. And I, I, this was the hardest transition when I came from Google, which was very trans, like, very collaborative, but collaborative, like you had to be in the room with a whiteboard to figure out what was going on. And um, I did not appreciate uh, that that was actually how I functioned. And I was most of the time remote even at Google and I still had not really fully digested how important it was um, to write things down. Process is really helpful. So having a process that everyone knows and can follow, um, naturally since, well, we have a issue tracker and we have a bunch of other tools that we do development. So we obviously use it. But um, what I shared here and you're welcome to go through it is literally a step-by-step -step process for almost anything you want to do remote that GitLab had published. We didn't know this was going to happen. This is just how we run as a company. 
Um, and so we've always written it down in a company handbook that's like 5,000 pages, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> um, and at first I was like, oh my gosh, so much process. But now everyone, I can miss a meeting. So there's like a process. If you start a meeting remote, like every meeting should have a Google Doc attached to it and questions should be in there and you people just work and answer the questions because when you're all remote and particularly now we're in a crisis situation where people are gonna have to step out, they need to be able to know what happened. And so just by having a Google Doc that you record everything in it and is attached to every meeting or you know running doc, we do that as a whole company. So we have like company calls and there's a place and everyone can add the questions and everyone gets the answers and the feedback and it keeps everyone on the same page, which is extremely important, generally in remote, but I'd say even more important now because we're going to have to step out for our kids or for health of an, you know, uh, of my grandma or for um, any number of reasons. And if that's recorded, you can go back to your doc. Like, I can't tell you how nice it is. I come back and go, oh, I missed the meeting and I don't have any fear of missing it now because I can go click on the meeting. Oh, they put, if there's a, something discussed, it's in it and the doc with all the questions. So literally people just put their questions and answers are in it. I'm like, wow, awesome. I answered that and in five minutes, I didn't miss a thing that I was doing. Um, I think that's something that I've taken really to heart and it makes a really big difference in keeping people. So I don't know if that's of help, but that uh, we're doing a bunch of stuff as a company trying to help others make this transition because it's, it can't solve the hard parts like the individual stuff we got all work on. Uh, but I think there's some processes that can make it uh, a lot more workable. Sorry, long-winded answer. There's there's also too like the the social element of that, right? I uh, I'm I'm gonna share a, a a thing, and then I'd be interested, especially to hear Christina's take on it, since this was a thing that we did on a team that had pretty disparate time zones. Um, so uh, in my last role, I managed a team that spanned from US West Coast. We had all four of the mainland time zones to um, Central European time zones as well. Um, and one thing that we did just to have like some time where we all saw each other was we had a standing like like 15, 20 minute Zoom on our calendars at, at 9.30 Pacific time. So it was kind of like beginning of the day for Pacific people, end of the day for people in Europe. Um, and it was, it was like known as optional and on any given day, maybe like, 75 80 percent of the team would show up um and we just talk about not work stuff or like sometimes we would talk about work stuff too if someone had something that was like really thorny and they needed to like rubber duck with someone um but yeah i think having a, a set time uh for your team to, to socialize is really important um i'm particularly interested in christina's take on this because uh one sort of like informal guideline we had at that previous company was teams could have you could choose two out of these three areas you could have people on your team from uh so we, we had people from um like uh like um apac like asia pacific time zones north american time zones and then european time zones but it's really if you haven't worked in that kind of setting before uh let me just tell you trying to schedule a meeting for those three groups simultaneously is almost impossible like someone's going to be up at midnight so we had an informal guideline at this last company where it was like well you can choose for any like individual team you get two of those time zones not you can't hire people from all three so that there is a little bit of overlap but i'm curious it, like for christina's take on this like did you find some ways to keep people socially integrated as well if you have people from all three time zones on the same team yeah, I think um, that that's like the worst possible scenario is to have in all three regions and for individual teams like that for engineers across those um, we've had teams like that at Zapier and then have purposely moved to where they're um, across two of the regions. So we've purposely moved folks to where they're better aligned at the time zone and like we're okay having teams in APAC, but our idea is building out regional teams like that. So in that region or in the Western US, you know, and um, Europe and Eastern, Eastern time, things like that. Cause it's, it's so, it's just hard. Like we're human. And so if you don't ever get to talk to somebody or ever get to overlap, that's just super difficult. Like, I think that's difficult. I don't think you solve that right now, honestly. Um, and so it, one of the other things that we did, uh, so the water cooler chats, I love that. Like the, the zoom rooms and like, okay, we have a set water cooler chats. We have teams that do that. We have teams that do a water cooler chat in Slack. So every team has their own channel. That's kind of their space to like jam as a team. And a lot of the ad hoc conversation happens there. And then every 
afternoon or every certain time, okay, here's the water cooler thread. Like, and it just asks a really ridiculous question or asks some really like completely outside of work. Um, you know, what's the weather like, or what are you doing this weekend or whatever it is. And it just brings together that culture and brings together that time as, as people, you know, and, and shares. I think that's super important. Um, I think plus one to the like over communicate. If you feel like you're over communicating in a remote context, you're probably just scratching the surface of doing it right. Um, so it's uh, it feels weird. It feels awkward as you're starting to do it, but it's like, I, I tell people in interviews, it's, it's kind of like Instagramming your food, you know, you feel kind of weird about it, but it's like, no, 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 just go ahead and do it. Cause it's like, that's going to be right. Um, but you know, I think, those things are important. Cultural, the other thing I'll add is that we used to do, and we've done this at Zapier as well, meals for teams. Like you go and, and so talking about kind of more celebration or how do you, how do, you do team building, um, buying meals for people and saying, hey, go you know, have delivered whatever your favorite restaurant is, whether that's breakfast for you or lunch at the time or dinner or the closest meal to you and let's jump on a call for an hour and just have a meal together. Um, we can't go have lunch. We can't go out and get beers, you know, things like that. But that sort of builds that community as well, um, which has been really cool. So, um. Yeah, the, the thread that I see whenever this question comes up, and uh, I, I think one of the biggest changes to remote is just that commu those communication patterns, like, like you've addressed, Christina. And, and you, you have to pull things out of people, and people have to intentionally push. And I, I really like the... Uh, Instagram your food analogy that's uh, uh, we actually have a food channel in our slack just for pictures of food that people really are excited about uh, which it, you're, you're making an analogy and I'm drawing a direct line but still um, so then I mean along these lines one of the questions is uh, this person says I've worked remotely for three and a half years and have continually struggled with finding a solution that emulates the value of folks jamming together in front of whiteboard I've used various tools like Zoom's whiteboarding, Envision's freehand, but haven't found something that works well for this purpose. Do you have recommendations on tools for getting the fidelity and ease of a whiteboard yet are workable for remote employees? And I know that uh, Google tried to solve this with the Jamboard or whatever it was that uh, I think I saw once at an event and have never seen otherwise. But yeah, let me turn that over to y'all. What, what uh, solutions do you have for that? In uh, in my previous role, uh, we were pretty heavily written culture, and so when it came to needing whiteboards for uh, like architectural diagrams, like vetting, like things that we we're going to build, um, we would draw them out in like Google Draw and stick it into Google Doc. Um, not ideal. Uh, if we needed to explain something live, we would just suffer through using Zoom whiteboard. It's d definitely not the best, um, but that was typically what we would use. Um, and then in terms of um, Another, this is maybe slightly tangential, but so related, another thing that is a lot easier in person, even though it's not like drawing architectural diagrams, is retros um, and getting to use a lot of like post-it notes for that. Um, I do have a really good suggestion for a tool there. Um, it's called Retrium. I can stick a note in the chat, um, but I like absolutely, that, that actually like comes very close to recreating the in-person experience of like, having a bunch of post-it notes and moving things around. Plus one on Retrium. And, and I see Brandon had to get up and leave the room. So this is the kind of thing that happens in remote uh, all the time, just so, so people know. I, I get up and like go get tea all the time in the middle of calls too. And thankfully Bluetooth headphones, I can continue talking from the kitchen. But uh, anyways, Swarna, did you have something to add about the whiteboarding topic? Uh, yeah, I mean, whiteboarding, it's, um, I see, I, I don't do it personally because I don't have the necessity, but um, I see a lot of uh, engineers in our community because the Cloud Foundry community also has this whole pairing culture and a ton of our engineers pair distributedly. They're engineers from all the different time zones and regions that pair and I, I see them use um, Slack calls significantly and I think the Retro tool, uh, the Retrium, and uh, there's a couple of other tools that our folks use as well that, um, that they have found super useful. Uh, while I don't have the whiteboarding tool recommendation, I use my remarkable paper. Uh, it's super useful, pretty slick in the sense that I have it 
right next to me. It's like a notebook. Um, I just draw it on, on that and then it syncs up to my Google Drive. And I have also created that folder to sync up to a common shared folder. So anytime I need to reference something, it's already there in a shared folder. It's not the best or ideal tool, but at least Remarkable Paper has been helping me in that kind of aspect where I don't need to pick up a notepad or paper, scan it or take a picture of it and send it. That's a really good point. Can I throw one more thing in there before we go? Um, go for it. I found that, especially with engineers, um, collaboration on documentation is really important. And you'll want to choose a tool. You know, Google Docs is fine, Dropbox, pa Dropbox Paper is fine, but we've actually had most success doing our documentation, uh, even with architectural diagrams and things through GitHub or GitLab or some other kind of source control because it allows engineers to review and comment and collaborate and you know version things in a way that they're already familiar with. And I think we've had really good success in that way. So that might be another thing to think about. Has the added Brandon bonus does. Of, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Christine. Just the added bonus of like that documentation being with the code. I think that's, that's super important. Um, it's very easy to have tool sprawl in the remote world. Uh, we have it very bad. Uh, there's probably four different ways that you could create a doc and share it and collaborate on it, um, which is painful. But, uh, but yeah, I love that. I think whatever is the easiest, the lowest barrier to entry, honestly, like freehand is a great tool. I used to work at Envision, so I, I loved it. It was my favorite product. Um, Lucid chart, Google Draw, like whatever works. Like I feel like the more important part is being able to get your ideas out and be able to share the ideas. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, maybe you iterate from there, but whatever the, the easiest thing to get started to kind of share an idea is important. So, so Brandon, you got up and walked away for a second. The, the questions about whiteboarding, I don't know if you heard at the beginning. I, I was, yeah, I, was I heard it sick. You're laughing okay. because I came from Google and you're like, hey, this Jamboard thing, which is cool, <laughs> but you have to have a, like a $4,000 Jamboard. Microsoft well, that's, that's, I mean, everyone's that done I was that. Gonna ask. <laughs> well, I'm curious if GitLab has process and all of this written down somewhere in your 5,000 page uh, employee handbook, is there a blessed way to do uh, whiteboarding? Um, no, uh, we don't. So there's a couple of things that are a little differences. Uh, the way that GitLab kind of operates because it's both because we're in 64 countries. So dealing with that previous question, you're almost always like we operate with an async model. So like this question is very a sync model, which is valuable um, because we tend to operate as async for there's more reasons than just because we're all over 64 countries. We also have about 10,000 other contributors to the code base. So you have to be able we tend to start very much with write as much down as you have on a proposed idea. And it's always, always issued. It's always in an issue because it can be tracked because everyone can see it because you can know who the direct decision maker is. Um, I mean, you could choose other tools. We're obviously biased. So we use GitLab because we're GitLab, but I think the issue tracking was one also that shocked me. Um, and in a non engineer so I'd, I like engineers talk about engineers. I'll talk about like just marketing, uh, just any interaction, starting with, hey, if there's something, there's a work product you want to get done, and engineers are better at this than honestly others, put it in an issue and then assign people. And then we just usually attack Google Docs to it or a Google drawing or something else. But the issue becomes the place that everyone uh, can jointly get their input. Um, that is a very async method, though, just to be clear, right? So if you want to do close... Uh, synchronization work like we jump on zoom and isn't that we don't use those tools uh, but I think the others have put some really good ideas out there and I, I don't have a better idea for how you do a magic whiteboard okay um, well let's shift direction to something much lighter weight for just a second uh, just as an interval what does your office look like uh, and let's start with Sarah because um, I know what your office looks like and this will be interesting Sure. <laughs> I'm definitely not going to show you my office. However, uh, my office is in a closet and you can potentially see the closet doors there. Um, I built my desk into a closet. It's a piece of plywood that I screwed into the studs. 
I have shelving on either side. I, you know, I wanted to be able to close it at the end of the day and kind of create a boundary between work and home because I've done this for a while. I also don't have enough room in my house to be able to have an entire office to myself. Uh, I share my office with this lovely snake here, which makes an appearance in meetings sometimes and is fun. Uh, I do have a lockable door, so nobody comes trouncing in. Um, but yeah, I have a balance board that I stand on, which is relatively new within the past six months, and I love it. And, um, you know, I don't know if anybody cares, but I have a Yeti mic, and I use the camera on my MacBook. Um, it's a pretty standard setup for me, and I do stand up most of the day, um, and I take meetings all day for the most part. So, um, yeah, that's me. And who wants to go next? I converted my older kid's bedroom into my office. <laughs> I just moved uh, his bed into the younger kid's bedroom and I'm like, you share a bedroom now, this is my office. Um, thankfully that also kind of helped me because now we set up a couple of desks for the kids as well to do their homework. Um, but none of us have chairs, we all stand. We only have one chair that I'm sitting on right now and we always have to take turns. Um, that's usually, I mean, the, we kind of did that intentionally because we did not want all of us sitting the whole time. Um, after I switched to the work from home uh, job, I also invested in a stand-up desk. So it's, it gives me the options. I um, don't have a fancy monitor and so it's just a basic monitor and the usual Apple keyboard and such. But um, I did experiment different places in my house. I use the dining table. I use my kitchen island counter. I use my bedroom. I use this office space as my office locations. Um, I do have to say that it's it's really fluid for me. My office space is really fluid. It depends on what I feel like using as office space in my house that day. And Kate, you're in emergency office space, so talk to us about your yeah. Uh, welcome to my office slash kitchen. Um, so that is where I'm working from right now. And for the most part, like my roommate and I are sharing this tiny slice of counter, but he, he gave me the right of way in the kitchen for this. So that was very kind of him. Um, I am kind of thinking like, um, yeah, we're just gonna, uh, have to deal with the combined meeting schedule for, for now. But like I said, hopefully, uh, we'll have a couple of like small desks in, in the living room at, at some point soon. And, uh, Christina? So I, I am super lucky. I've got a, a dedicated office space with a door, uh, which is nice, but the door has windows. And so every, every day around three 30 or four, I'll, I'll, I'll hear a tap, 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 tap on my, on my door. And one of the tiny humans is just staring at me like, are you done? I'm like, no, go away. Um, but uh, they mostly like setting those boundaries is super important. You know, Swarna talked about that where um, they kind of know I, I say goodbye to them at the beginning of the day and say, I'm going to work. And they're sort of like, okay. And like kind of avoid this part of the house, which is nice, but takes practice like over and over again. Um, I'm not going to show you the rest of my office. It's really messy right now, but I have a stand up desk. I have a, another monitor. I use just the computer um, camera. I have very fancy headphones, clearly, um, but that's kind of what's worked. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I also use a tool called Crisp, K-R-I-S-P dot A-I. It is a lifesaver. It is something that it is worth the money. Um, if, if you are working remotely, there's external sound, kids screaming, dogs barking. Um, it sort of takes all of that away to the other person. I can't tell you how often I tell somebody, um, oh my God, can you hear that? Can you hear my, my oldest screaming? And they're like, no, sounds great. I'm like, great, that's great. Um, so it's, it's a great small tool that you can install and it um, is very much worth it. Um, yeah, I mostly stay in my office. I don't, I don't have any fluidity in my office space because it's either here or like I'm not productive anywhere else. Um, so mostly because I'm on meetings almost all day, so. Brandon, what's your office look like? Uh, my office, I am lucky enough that my wife happens to uh, be uh, an interior architect. So what I have here has nothing to do with me. She just set it up. Uh, I have a 
balance ball that I try and rotate to. So I have this. Uh, and then I like screen real estate. So uh, I've got a large real wide screen here and then I actually hold another one here. Uh, so that's a uh, separate keyboard and stuff. And then just because we write everything down, I actually have a link of what we do. And so I actually put that in there because I don't know, those are questions. And so we answered them, but that's of any help. Nice. Yeah. And I, my, uh, and a directional mic, this thing with a little mute button, if you listen carefully. Yeah. Yeah. Really nice. Then you don't have to find the keyboard to mute. <laughs> Got to find the lapel though. Um, my wife does not appreciate my design style. So the only thing hanging on my wall is a picture that one of my kids drew right here. And, uh, she tells me what I can't hang on my wall. She never approves anything. So my walls are barren. And uh, I have a stick that I brought down from the mountains to, because it was just white wall for forever. But uh, you know, people, people on the calls need something to look at. Uh, I will say this is clean and this that you can't see is a total disaster. Uh, and um, yeah, there's, it's, I see Swarna, you're pushed up against the wall, so you have more room to do that too. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's not an uh, unusual situation at all. Okay, well, so, oh, go ahead, Swarna, do you have something to add to that? I just wanted to say I had to flip my desk. Um, I, yeah, I just had to rotate my desk so I could have the wall as a backdrop after this whole new situation propped up this week. Yeah, the, the first uh, place, we, we rented a house the first year that I was working remote and I was in a basement with windows that were way up high and it was like a dungeon and I started to go crazy and now having windows right here and when my kids are outside playing in the summer and I can just look out and see them jumping on the trampoline or whatever, it's, it's, it's nice. So uh, if you're gonna do it longer term, get something that works. Cough, cough, Kate. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Um, there's, there's you should have seen my old stuff. setup, man. It was so sweet. It was, be <laughs> it was beautiful. Just as you give it up, you get forced work remote again. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about this. I think this is something that's probably going to come up a lot. A, a lot of folks have worked remotely a day a week or a couple days a week. Um, what, in your opinion, you know, needs to change for that? We've addressed some of that. Or maybe what advice do you have for people that are going from that to uh, now full-time working from home and never being in the office to get on the same page as people. You know, if, if you work from home, there's a lot of like, you get in some, or work, work from home one day a week, you get in some patterns of, well, I'll just talk about that when I'm back in the office with that person. So um, go for it. Uh, yeah, I will say uh, just a quick note on ergonomics. If you only been working from home once or twice a week, you haven't really tested out how your home setup is going to feel ergonomically five days a week. So just be conscious of that, practice good posture, pay attention to what your body is telling you. I second that. Um, I already mentioned it on the chat as well, that yeah, I selected my kitchen as a workspace for the first six months and that did not go well. <laughs> I gained a ton of weight and I realized that one of the patterns that I had to set for myself was also the food patterns, when I was gonna snack, when I was gonna eat my food. Um, so now I just bring up a couple of travel mugs full of coffee so that uh, I'm caffeinated during the day. But yeah, I, it's establishing the pattern, establishing the exercise, the workout routine and everything. Um, and I think, now is a great time to do that as well because we all kind of know that we are trying to get settled into this new routine at least for the shorter time frame and uh folks at least know that we are not going to be productive so it might as well we might as well take this time to even get a workout um, incorporated into our daily routine i think for me going totally remote one of the things um, that was important to me. This is not for everybody, but um, I shower every day. I get actually dressed every day to go to work um, because it felt like, okay, that's how I'm going to start my day so that I could have some separation of what felt like, you know, I'm in home life. I'm walking 10 feet. Now I'm in work, you know, and, and having that routine has been for me, super important so that I can have that separation. And then at the end of the day saying, okay, I'm going to stop working for a bit. I go make dinner. Um, I try not to look at Slack or look at my phone for like 
an hour or two at least. Um, sometimes I jump on later, but that's just for like with my role right now. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. I think having a hard stop is super key because it's super easy for your work day to kind of bleed into everything when you can work anywhere. Um, patterns for sure, schedule, having patterns of when you eat, making sure you're scheduling that in, um, eating lunch, it's super easy to just like eat at your desk for 10 minutes, um, way more so because you're not kind of forced to get out of the house or forced to like, you know, oh, people are going to lunch, let's go. So I think trying to trying to keep that normalcy, like as much of the day-to-day in office normalcy of your patterns in the, in at home or wherever you're working is important. Anyone else? Sarah, Brandon, Swerna? Oh, Swerna piped in, I guess. Already. Go ahead. Brandon. No, I, I think I uh, pressed enter halfway through the sentence. I, I also wanted to kind of, uh, to Christina's point about uh, not letting your work day bleed into your entire day. I think it's also key to remember that uh, staying online is not necessarily important all the time. Uh, we even in our community, uh, folks set up their Slack status or email status as um, as appropriate. Like I'm online during these hours, or I'm head stepping away from keyboard for a second. So it's always important to let the team know when you're going to be online and when you're not going to be online, um, so that you set that kind of discipline even for the rest of the folks, because you don't want folks to expect you to be online all the time. Um, and I think proving to someone else that we're just being online and hence productive is, I think, is the wrong way to approach that. Um, I think that, sorry, just one thing on, on, on that. I think that gets, that's super important as you're sharing your space or if, you're, if your schedule is off because now kids are home or you're working right next to your roommate, like all these things, like I think, setting very clear expectations with the people that you work with of when you're going to be online or when you're not super important, like just being very clear about that. I just say the biggest thing is if you lead people, you got to over communicate. Don't forget how important it is and that it's written down that they can, that you have the reach out and the, the touch, touch base with them, particularly with the changes. That's hard. That's the people part. And I think um, that onus as a leader lands on us. If you're a leader and you're leading people or guiding people. I think along those lines, particularly in this current situation, if you can share that you're also having a hard time, that helps people have the freedom to have a hard time. Um, and, uh, you know, also if you can squeeze in a laugh, uh, today my daughter got on our company website since she's home all day and had a conversation with one of our salespeople. I would like to buy a Kubernetes. What size do you have them in? Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that, that cheered me up. Sarah, anything to add? No, I think people covered most of it. Okay. So one of the questions uh, on here, and Sarah has responded in text, but uh, I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts. Uh, how do you keep from talking over each other? Um, I do, I have a friend who works for a remote company and he shared a screenshot once of a large Zoom that he was in, like 20 people, and there were people holding up fingers one or two or three, and apparently they put themselves in a queue and count down till it's their turn to share. And uh, we do not do that. And that sounds extremely awkward to me. His, his comment was, it is really awkward the first time, and then it's totally fine. Uh, but uh, what methods do y'all have? Given that we just spoke on top of each other a little bit, uh, what's worked? I can speak to that one, at least what we do at Fairwinds. Um, we're very well practiced at you're muted if you're not talking. Um, for the most part, people are on video, but that's not always true. Um, Generally, all of our meetings will have a facilitator. 
uh, it's not an official position, but like generally somebody will take the lead and run through the agenda because like GitLab, we have an agenda attached to all of our meetings. Um, that facilitator is generally very practiced at looking for people who unmute as you know Kendall has actually kind of been showing us throughout this whole webinar. Um, if somebody unmutes that means they want to talk um, and so then whenever somebody's finished talking you can call on that person next. Um, the other way to do it is the facilitator generally is very good at the awkward pause um, when there's a silence after the conversation stops and then you say you know you wait just a little bit longer and then if somebody unmutes they can start talking um you know then you can also say something at the end of a topic like does anybody have any more thoughts feelings concerns etc and then you pause and then you say okay good we'll move on to the next thing that's generally how we do it um and it works fairly well i would say we've tried the hand raising feature that zoom has and it's I think you could get it to work, but you again would have to have somebody who watches that and make sure that they call on the right people. So building on that, I think if you're small enough, we're just right, like this panel's just large enough that you can quickly adjust, but you start getting bigger and it gets real tricky. Um, we built off the idea, so every, every meeting has an agenda, because otherwise arguably, if you wanna just meet to meet with people, it doesn't have an agenda, like a one-on-one. -on -one. But if you have five or six people, you're using a lot of time, you probably have an agenda. Um, in it, we just have like questions. So people actually write their questions and in a Google Doc. So if a Google Doc's attached to the doc, you go into the doc and if you have a question, you write out the question and then you verbalize it. But that then creates an order and then everyone also helps answer it. So it kind of solves two things. It helps the order in which you're going. Uh, and if you want to see this, we publish everything on YouTube so you can watch an, how this works like live. That works really well. It also solves something else depending on if you're on a bigger company or speak. some people love to verbalize, right? I have no issue talking too much. However, Rick, one of this, we're shifting this is we, have, we need to be aware. We're now shifting to a world where if someone isn't, uh, is a significantly an introvert, they're going to be sidelined in a world that's set up as fully remote. And in doing a written process, it works very well for uh, engaging. It, it slows down people like me to think through what I'm saying. And it allows people to engage that are either more introverted or process through uh, uh, and want to ask a question a different way. They don't even have to verbalize. It can be written by whoever is answering it. Uh, and that process, I think, has uh, has shown to be a lot of pluses it has one minus google docs you can't go past you can have a lot of participants like a thousand but you can only have a hundred people editing a doc at one time so there is a gap that that starts hitting that i'm actually now trying to solve uh, but for the majority of what you're doing uh i think that process is inclusive in a way for people to have a different way of engaging as well that we we found really helpful because we do have at GitLab, we're fully remote, we get more introverts on average than you might if, uh, you know, you had an interview and be in a, in, in a location all the time, so. Today I learned someone actually stress tested the number of people that can edit the Google Docs and so on. <laughs> we have a random stress test. That's a separate conversation if you want to know how that works. We found out the little loopholes in Zoom and Slack and, uh, and Google Docs. And Kate, uh, did you pass it down? Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, but I think okay. I'm number two because I've seen Christina uh, unmuting before I started. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to take the number two spot. Right, very good. Just real quick for smaller meetings, we um, typically do either H for hand or next in the Zoom chat. So then you keep the order of who is next. And then uh, it's pretty easy to say like, oh, clearly it's this person's turn. That works for like this size meeting, maybe a little bit bigger. For our all hands where there's like 300 people, we do Zoom, but then have tools like either Slido or Dory are two tools that we've used, which is basically, a, it's like the Q&A function on Zoom, but everybody can kind of see that the questions that they come in, they can upvote them. If they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I have the same question, like let's upvote that. And that helps, you can see, it's kind of amazing in our all hands, you'll see the Zoom chat, be complete 
chatter. Like it will go by super fast. Like people either people are introducing to the company, right? And everybody's like, oh, you know, 300 welcome messages fly by or people making jokes or like side conversations happening in the Zoom chat and then real questions happening in Slido or Dory. Um, and basically anybody that's facilitating is just ignoring chat and saying, okay, just carry on. But that's what for us. Yeah, I was gonna add that I think a lot of this falls on the facilitator of the meeting. Um, one really interesting thing that I found with a fully remote team that I previously managed was um, when we were all on Zoom, um, we all tended to talk at a pace that gave other people opportunities to jump in if they needed to. Um, and so the team like self-regulated pretty well when we were all on Zoom. But when we got together for our first ever like all in one place on site, what happened, uh, I noticed by like halfway on the first day that a lot of us in person are actually like very fast talkers. And there was one team member that like just wasn't jumping in because the pace of conversation was so much faster in person for most of the group than like, as opposed to this one person who was also still kind of like a slower talker in person. Um, and so we had to like take a step back and recognize like, wow, like we really do communicate differently in person as opposed to on the Zoom. So I think uh, like for people who are transitioning to uh, remote, um, uh, like making sure that you are coaching your team or if you're you know not in a management position you can still just you know lead by example or suggest it to your manager but um making sure you're slowing down the pace of conversation and decision making so that people feel like they do have that space to jump in yeah and sarah just made a comment here that uh i was going to mention that we we have an engineer who uses a screen reader and the zoom function in chat is actually not nearly as good it's, it's actually painful you could he he shared it with us so we can like hear it'll it'll reread things it reads super slowly you know all kinds of problems uh and so we generally have a slack channel per meeting so like engineering office hours there's an engineering office hours chat channel in slack for all that back conversation that's going on so uh, lots of different ways to do that, but um, well, for time's sake, we need to wrap up. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to the panelists. Thank you all for making the time for this and getting on and being uh, friendly and fun and uh, witty throughout. Um, I think it was a, a helpful thing. We tackled lots of good topics here. We will. Um, we are recording this. Uh, David will be sending out a recording of this to everyone that's here and people who couldn't come. Uh, if you signed up for this, you are not being put into a marketing campaign. And if we mess that up, uh, you can send an email to me and yell angrily. But uh, this is intended to just be helpful and not a salesy thing. So thanks, everyone. And thanks, panelists, for being a part of it. And uh, have a great day, everyone.